Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are at Hunt Expo. I am at the Born Primitive booth with the one and only Bear Hanlon, co-founder of Born Primitive Apparel. And um, man, I just really want to extend a heartfelt thank you for number one, making the time to sit down with me today. I know you're super busy. You guys have so much going on, so much your company is growing at such a tremendous rate and to have your time for this podcast is truly an honor and um, thank you for the warm welcome on your team as well. Like I'm, I'm super stoked to be um, to be working with you guys, which is which is why I want to do this podcast. You know, I really want to share the heart of your story and your mission and what you're doing with viewers and listeners out there as well. Well, thank you for having me on and obviously thank you for being a part of the brand. We, we appreciate it. Yeah. So tell everybody like a, a little like high level backstory. You're a dude from California. Is that where you're no, born No, actually, uh, Indiana, actually. Indiana, yeah, okay. Yeah, a All Midwest, right. just a patriotic Midwestern guy. Gotcha. Yeah. So you went to California then for military? Yeah, I did some training out okay. there and then I we ended up in Virginia Beach. Um, so we've been in Virginia Beach since 2016. Nice. Yeah. I'm friends with the governor of Indiana's wife, Janet. Okay. And I took her elk hunting a few years ago. She's a good friend. She's now an accomplished sheep hunter. Okay, uh, nice. So Indiana is a cool state. You know, it's a gun loving uh, Second Amendment it is. friendly state. You it guys is. have Camp, Camp Atterbury there, mm-hmm. which uh, is a great friend to shooting sports and competitive shooting. And that's a great place to call home, I guess, you know. Absolutely. If, yeah, so you didn't grow up like hunting. No, I actually, because sports was big for us growing up. Yeah. I'm the youngest of three brothers. So, yeah, like, well, we you were, don't look athletic at all. <laughs> so, I don't know where that came from. We were <laughs> jumping in and out of minivans, going to practice, you yeah. know, our basically our whole upbringing. Um, so, but, sports were you playing baseball, football, basketball, yeah, what, all yeah, of the above? Yeah, and then I ended up playing football in college. Okay. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was kind of like my upbringing. But obviously, a lot of my friends did it. Um, and, uh, you know, I've wanted to get into it obviously yeah. now we're in this you know i gotta get out with aaron and you know obviously no no better person to learn from than, than yeah. a guy like aaron so um yeah that's kind of you know why in the, in the early days it, it never was just never really a thing but yeah. I, it obviously i fully support it i didn't know it, mm-hmm. have any issues with it so so and you're you're super patriotic obviously you served our country for how many years were you in uh just under eight years eight yeah. years yeah. yeah and you were a navy seal i was yeah, or are, I guess that, I don't know how that terminology is. Is it a former yeah? I, I think you probably I you know I'd probably still consider it present tense, but you know obviously not still serving, but yeah. I still try to. I feel you like know. you could still do the job <laughs> if they needed to call you. Like you're in shape, you could just go run out there. And well, do it. I think that's what you try to maintain. You yeah. know what I mean? Just uh, you know, it's more of a just a mentality, right? It's a lifestyle. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So what called you to serve? Uh, eighth grade, I was in 9-11, you know, I was sitting in, uh, in French class and I knew when I, we, that we got sent home from school, I knew in, in that moment, like that's, you know, eventually I'm going to, I'm going to sign up, you know, yeah. young eighth grade kid and the thought of, you know, other men fighting on my behalf. And, you know, it just was like, this is, we just obviously our, our way of life and our culture was just attacked. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's on us, you know, particularly I think men to, to, to man up and go Protect fight. Protect and provide. That's yeah. kind of like the the essence or the essence of being man yeah. is protect and provide yeah, yeah so that's kind of where the seed was planted and then i almost joined the navy out of high school mm-hmm. um, i was like talking with recruiters but football was progressing and i was getting starting to get recruited by schools so my parents kind of said hey why don't you go get your degree and if you still want to do this crazy dream when you're done then you can do it after you graduate and i was like all right well i like football be, that sounds like fun so that's kind of what i did I, you know ended up kind of pushing that off for for a few years and going to college and getting where'd a you go to college I went to yale okay yeah. So you're a smart guy too. <laughs> I guess I, I I think I'm more of a hard worker than a smart guy. Well, but, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. They, this hard work can trump 
uh, a bit natural ability a lot of times. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just scrappy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You tried hard. So you went to Yale. You came out with what type of degree? Political science. Political science. Yeah. Okay. Yep, and then I, I actually took a job with Red Bull for a while. I was doing mm -hmm. like brand marketing for them, mm -hmm. which was awesome. They're a really cool company. Um, and then I, I real I was getting a lot of pressure from the family to not do the military, so I actually kind of shelved the dream for about a year. And then I, I silently, secretly started training when no one, without telling anyone. Mm -hmm. I was going to the pool and going to the track and doing all these things like kind of early in the morning, and no one knew about it. And I finally came back and. I got accepted into the program um, to go to officer candidate school with a contract to go to SEAL training. And a few days before I left, I, I, told, I showed my mom the letter, and I was like, this is happening. So she didn't have a Did whole lot. Did she cry? Or oh, she, yeah. yeah. And honestly, it, it, in hindsight, it was on Mother's Day, so that was probably oh. not, a, not a great time to yeah. do it. Because she, she's <laughs> celebrating being a mom, and she's not yeah, terrified yeah. to lose her son. But I was like, I prolonged yeah. telling her because I was leaving in like a week. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to tell her early because then she's going to be miserable that much longer. So And worry. Yeah. That's how I finally said, you know, I was you know staying up at night, staring at the ceiling for a couple of years straight, thinking about this. It constantly occupied my mind, and I finally was like, I got to do this. So that's what I did. Is that what drove you also in some capacity? Because you're, you're a huge CrossFit athlete. Like, you're a national level CrossFit athlete. And is that kind of what secretly drove you in that sport as well? The only reason I started CrossFit was because I was preparing for, for SEAL training, and a lot of the guys I was training with were doing CrossFit yeah. to like get in better shape. I'd never even heard of CrossFit. Gotcha. So I, I only took it up to get more physically prepared for training, and okay. I, it kind of, by a fluke, um, you know, I, I was decent at it. You know, I had a college strength and conditioning background, like, you know, so, I, you know, I, I was ahead of, you know, kind of the pack right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was able to go out and compete at the CrossFit Games, and yeah. then, like, the next year I joined the military. So my competitive career was very short, but it wasn't meant to be a competitive career. I was doing it to, you know, physically prepare my body for some pretty brutal training. So Yeah, body and mind. Yes, yes. I mean, CrossFit, I mean, it's a, a far cry from, I think, is it Buds that you go to? Yes. A yeah. far cry from Buds is CrossFit, but I can tell you there's many CrossFit workouts that I've done where I go home and I'm flat out on the couch, like, on the verge of vomiting and my mom's like are you okay but did you win yes i won yeah, <laughs> like yeah, you know yeah. what i mean like oh, yeah. you survived it you might want to die afterwards for a second but you sur so it does have a lot of mental conditioning aspect to it so, absolutely um not obviously anywhere but for civilians it's a great way to kind of cross train your mind and your body um absolutely. so I, I get it um which is kind of a little bit where born primitive was was in essence born yes yes you so created shorts for guys because you were doing what was it, cleans or jerk? The, the snatch. Yeah, yeah, snatches. Yeah. His snatch is the reason <laughs> that's right. that Born Primitive was born, <laughs> for, you know, people, in case you guys want to know. That's <laughs> right, yeah. So we were training a lot of heavy you know, uh, Olympic lifting, and one of the lifts is snatch. And, you know, in the transition port of the portion of the lift, there's a tendency to, like, drill your pubic bone, yeah. you know, when you kind of throw your hips at the bar. Um, so long story short, I took an old pair of football girdle, and uh, my neighbor was a seamstress. I ha we cut out the quad pad and stitched it to the groin area. Yeah. Um, and that was like my first working prototype. And I had no intent on making it. I mean, that was just going to be one of one. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just was solving a niche solution that I needed in my life. And then guys at the gym were encouraging me to, hey, you should make that. And I did some more research and realized in the Olympic lifting community that actually was solving a problem that was yeah, you somewhat need prevalent. Yeah. In the marketplace. So I self educated on supply chain and business. You know, I just, you know, I was. Um, I was just winging it, yeah. um, and I remember we had to order 200 units for the first order, which to me was like the wildest thing ever. Like, you know what I mean? And then yeah. I went to officer candidate school. Um, so I, you know, it was like this was months before I went to officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. So horrible timing. Um, but I think if there's any lesson from that, is like if you're waiting to do something, the timing, Don't. the timing will never be perfect. No. So just freaking do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, because if I can launch a business a month before going to boot camp, um, you know, you can you can do more than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you and your, uh, at the time, wife were going to CrossFit competitions and setting up. I mean, like, I'm still the person I set up my booth and I'm hustling my stuff, right? Yeah. I get the hustle. You guys were going, so you'd go and train or you would go and, and do whatever you're doing and come home and you're working. And you never had a break no. for, like, six years. Yeah, no, no, not even close. Yeah, we, we would go to every CrossFit competition we could. And even when I was in SEAL training, you know, I remember I, you know, once you get through the initial part, you actually can, like, live off base. So you'd mm -hmm. come home on, like, a late, late on a Friday night after getting your ass handed to you all week. And, and you gotta you're, be, like, exhausted. You're exhausted. You're, you know, probably partially injured. You're, you haven't slept a lot. You're stressed. Your central nervous system is smoked. Um, and, you know, you got to be back at work probably at, like, 4 a.m., like, Monday morning. So you do have the weekend, but most guys would take that time to recover, mm -hmm. sharpen their dive knives, like, 
prep their gear, you know what I mean? Rest. Like get off their feet, you know, like you, you need to recover. And, you know, I would walk in the door and Mal would be like, hey, we got to pack the Jeep because we got to be in Anaheim tomorrow morning and we got to leave at 530 in the morning. And so we'd be on our feet doing a trade show or not a trade show, but like yeah. it was the same idea. Same. You set up a little tent yeah. and, we, you know, we jam the Jeep packed in as tight as mm -hmm. we could. And we would do that, come back, have to inventory everything in the garage. It'd be Sunday night and I'm getting the Sunday scaries and like so. Uh, it was funny. I, I went on the, the Diesel Brothers podcast, um, you know, a couple of days ago, and we, we had this funny kind of epiphany. We, we used the term dumb enough. Like, I was, I was dumb enough to not know any better. Mm -hmm. I wasn't too smart to overthink it and yeah. realize how, you know, like, this is not, you know, kind of plausible. Um, but I wasn't too dumb. It was like I was just dumb enough to not yeah. really know any better. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, I think I found that middle ground. <laughs> well, I listened to a podcast somewhere where you're like, yeah, if somebody would have told me that in six years you're going to work nonstop, you're not going to sleep, you're going to be constantly consumed, and you're not going to make any money, yeah. that you probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah, yeah, because I think the stats on startups is there's it's like between seven and eight yeah, percent. Slow. So yeah, if you had if you had again dumb enough, and I'd have had a, I'd have yeah. thought it through logically, I'd be like, okay, and it, you know it led to us getting divorced. Mel and I are totally cool now, but yeah. when you're running a business with your spouse and you're both that type A and like just so it's like hard. you know dedicated to make it work, um, make the business work. Obviously, there's other things that kind of fall yeah. to the wayside. So a lot was sacrificed. Um, a lot of you know late nights and early mornings and stress and yeah. you know so um but that's kind of what it takes you know like if if you want to do something like that if you want to be if you want to put yourself in the one percent you got to actually do some one percent shit work. right yeah. so um but again dumb enough right like <laughs> i didn't know any better this is just what we were doing right yeah i hear you and, and i as an entrepreneur i started my own business when i was in high school my first i owned a catering company in high school and and i've never really had like a, a normal job and so it's always been if I don't do it, no one's going to do it for me. And I get it. Like you have to be the one that gets up every day and you have to have the vision and you have to have the discipline and the drive to make it successful every day. And, and I think, you know, for you, it was passion, but also you saw potential and, uh, you, possibly maybe a little stubborn, Yeah. you know, you're not wanting to throw in the towel. Like you get knocked down you're like, well, I'm going to get back up. Cause that's just how you're wired. And, um, and you've really turned, you know, um, your snatch into, <laughs> <laughs> and do it like something really crazy. Um, another pivotal funny thing I thought listening to your podcast is the jort. Apparently yes. was yes. like a, um, and if you guys listening, watching, don't know what a jort is, that is a male short. It is jean variety. Extremely short and tight. Frayed. Frayed. Yep. And stretchy. Basically booty shorts for dudes. For dudes. That are, that are, that are totally. Well, and this yeah, was yeah, like yeah. a game changer for your company. Yeah, it was funny. We were on our first deployment, and one of my buddies had like a pair of like rodeo jeans that he that are, so it was like stretchy denim yeah. that he had like cut into jorts, and we would work out, you know, a lot on deployment. And I was just like, man, those are sweet. Like yeah. we got to make those. So he gave me his one pair, and we sent it to our suppliers. And like, can you find this stretchy denim fabric? And that's how the first. And when I wanted to do it, Mal, the, my co-founder, thought I was nuts. She was like, you are not doing that. I was like, I think that. I think the guys will wear it. Like this yeah. is like kind of that old school gritty mentality. I was like, it's kind of coming back. You know what I mean? And she trend thought, setting. He's she, gonna trend so set she on thought I was nuts. So I was like, all right, I got them down to the, they'll make a hundred pairs minimum. Like they wanted me to order 500 and I negotiate. I was like, all right, I'll buy a hundred pairs. And I figured I'd probably sell 10 and I'd give the other 90 away to my buddies who are just as dumb as I am. Right. That would wear them. So yeah. that's how it started. And then it sold out in like a day and then we ordered a thousand. And then, you know, now, I mean, we're selling like hundreds of thousands of those, right? It's in, it's absolutely insanity. It's like a um, cult-like following. But they're really like the thing is, guys are blown away because they're actually super comfortable. Yeah. Like it feels like you're wearing because it's so stretchy. And then, I live uh, in uh, leggings. Yeah. I get it. You're yeah. speaking my language. And then you know, you, yeah, I wear them to the gym a lot. I think people think I'm I'm nuts. Um, but at this point, I think they're just used to it. Like yeah. I'm wearing shorts to the gym a few days a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so well, yeah. If I put on jeans, people are like, oh. Where are you? Why are you getting dressed up? Yeah. Where are you going? So I get, I get it. I, you know, there it is. When you find something that works, run with it. And if you like it, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But so you're you're literally launching this company. So for six years, you guys are starting in your garage. You have a move up into some buildings. Lack of air conditioning at one point. I mean, you guys are like struggling as a company. Meanwhile, you're getting your butt kicked. 
in the military, you're serving our country, you're, you know, you're going out on deployments and uh, you have a lot going on. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, you, you're literally taking calls doing business when you're also fighting to protect our country. And, and that's the that's the key thing like I want people to understand about the culture of Born Primitive is you as a founder are putting everything on the line for freedom, but then you're also putting everything that you've got left on the line for a dream. Yeah. And I buy into that. Like that's what America is built on, the American dream that we can all succeed, that we can all be something. And if we want to do something, the only one stopping us is ourselves. And uh, give everybody like some insight on what that was like. Well, I, you know, balancing it was really hard. Um, you know, it's a very demanding job. You know, what I was doing in the military and, you know, deployments and stuff. Obviously, you're, you know, seven to ten time zones ahead. So I was taking Zoom calls at literally two o'clock in the morning with like our, you know, yeah. people back in the States. And, um, you know, every second I got that, you know, that there was an opportunity, I would try to get work done. And kind of a silly example, but one I've used before is, and at the time, I didn't even really think of it, but we were doing like a some maritime training down in um, down near Destin, and we were in a helicopter, and we were going to take down the ship. It was a training scenario, but we were going to like fast up on a ship and do the whole thing. And there was a delay, so the helo pilot came over the net and was like, "Hey, we're going to basically do racetracks for like 45 minutes, so just hang out. We're all jammed into the back, you know." And I'm like, we had our helo lanyards in and anything, so I was like, "Oh, let me pull my phone out and like knock out a few emails, right?" So like everyone else is hanging out, we're about to go like fast rope onto this like moving ship. And I'm knocking out emails on my iPhone. I remember I like wired a supplier like mm -hmm. a payment that was like, you know, like a couple million bucks. And then I just like put my phone back away. And they're like, all right, you know, 30 seconds, like ropes, you know, we're getting ready to pre prep the ropes. And that was so nonchalant. And then I remember I was telling Mal about that. And she was like, do you realize like, that this is, isn't normal. That is so insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, but it, that was just, that was what you did. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and it was, and that, that's what it took because, you know, minutes add up. You know what I mean? So every little mm -hmm. thing here and there you can do, or if you got home from a long training day, you know, sometimes we'd get there at eight o'clock in the morning, you're getting back to your hotel at 1130 at night and you've been doing, you know, some pretty intense training all day long, really stressful. It's meant to be stressful. Right. And then I'd have like a list from Mal, like 20 items long of like, hey, I need answers on this, this, this. So I have to open up my computer and like everyone else yeah. is going to bed to prep for the next day of training. And I'm like, damn it, I got to open up the laptop and do yeah. emails. Yeah, so. Talk about time management. And, and I would presume that during this, you know, you're not wasting a lot of time. You're not scrolling social media. You're not watching TV. You don't have a lot of time to recover, let alone just be wasteful of time. And I think that's something that so many of us are guilty of at home. We, we, you know, there's a lot of us, not to dive into like exercise psychology, we say, well, I don't have time, but we waste so much time. We do. Um, just, I mean, you can get on your phone and next thing you know, 45 minutes has gone by. You totally could have gotten a workout in. you Absolutely. could have done something to improve you could have read something learned something and you've just wasted this space and the one thing we can't recoup is time and so it sounds like during this phase of your life and probably still today there's not a lot of time wasted going on and, and hopefully at this point where you are now you get a chance to kind of breathe I see you have a kid yes maybe get to enjoy a little bit of time yes more. yeah I think it's kind of I always had the mentality like you know 99% of the time is like unless I'm doing something that's like improving my fighting position yeah. in life, like I don't, I'm not doing it. Right. Yeah. So like if it's not improving my health or I'm not, um, you know, kind of trying to build a business or something that's like improving my position, yeah. like things that just are idle, like watching Netflix or this or scrolling on Instagram, those are all, all idle things. You're not mm -hmm. improving your position at all when you're doing those things. Not to say it's bad, no. but you have to make a decision. It's like, if you want to, if you want to get ahead, you have to do things that are going to get you ahead. It's so yeah. simple. Um, so I would always get kind of anxious if I wasn't doing something that was, you know, kind of what I would consider something that's like improving my fighting position. You know what I mean? Um, and that's just how I was wired. I'm a little, I, I had to, you know, I've kind of worked through this with like therapy and stuff, but like I, I had to rewire that a little yeah. because now I'm at like a, I'm a full time, like single dad, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm raising a kid by myself and yeah. I had to realize, okay, like, logically that's right but now there's more it's much more it's complicated because yeah you know being a good a present father doesn't show up on your entrepreneurial stat sheet right you don't get points yeah. there's no it doesn't make a amount of money in your bank account go up it's yeah. not a measurable thing yeah. um, but you have to you know almost make it measurable and, and be so present so i had to you know, that's that was a hard adjustment because um, I'm competitive and when the business um, kind of needs me, but I know, you know, obviously my daughter needs me too. Mm -hmm. You get a little bit of pulled in two directions, but I've gotten a lot better with it now. I've been kind of at peace to be like, okay, when I shut it down, I shut it down and I'm present and, and you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a, you know, adjustment to go through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I love about what you guys have done also with your business is the 
the peril isn't just for dudes, right? It's not like you're a guy company. Um, you might have started with your vision of the one product, but you also have a business partner that um, came up with a, you know, there was some trending sports bras, which as a lady, I get it, I, I, I get it. And um, there were some trending sports bras and, and she saw some trends and was like, I can take and make this better. So both of you had this really kind of forward thinking, um, need-based design processes that you guys ran through. And you've done that across the board with all of your apparel, right? Whether it be your sports bras, your shorts, your athletic pants, everything that you're doing, you've taken something and you're like, hey, I wanna make it better. Um, I, you guys a shoe launch last week. Um, I'm from Oregon. I just love that you just were like, hey, we're going right for you, Nike. I'm yeah. not going to hold back on this. Oh, man, did, uh, I, did I stir up the hornet's we, nest on that one? We, we oh, want to do this. We're going to do it better. Yeah. And this yeah. is, and, and this is a, we're a patriotic company and we're proud of it. We're, you know, you have the other side of that, which, you know. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. From the beginning, we, we wanted to be a brand that stood for something, right? Like, hey, if we're going to do this, and honestly, that was just our values projected through a brand, right? Um, you know, loving our country and supporting those who serve. Um, and, you know, there's a gritty part of our brand, too. Like, we, we reject the victim mentality that's being pushed on our society Absolutely. by people that just want to control us and yeah. it's like no you can control your own destiny yeah. but you have to work your butt off mm -hmm. and you got to be brutally honest about what you actually bring to the table and if you're not working your butt off like you're not entitled to anything no. like, what do you expect if you do yeah. the bare minimum that you're going to have this like yeah. luxurious life yeah. no you're, you're being average you're going to get an average result mm -hmm. but there's this entitlement where they think even by putting in an average effort they, they deserve something mm -hmm. so we we cut against the grain on that i mean that's just how i was raised you only get what you earn, you know. Um, so, you know, we've, we've really embraced that as a brand. And, um, you know, recently getting into outdoor and then, you know, we just launched our tactical brand in October. I saw a lot of brands in the space that, like, didn't have those values. Yeah. And in, I feel like in this space, in the hunting space, and for definitely the tactical space, like, it should, it's a pretty patriotic audience. Yeah. And so why aren't the brands aligning with the values of mm -hmm. their base, right? And then that just rubbed me the wrong way. Well, and, because there's not a lot of brands that are open about it, right? But a lot of people insane. don't want to knock, rock a boat or turn away a potential sale or a customer or, an, you know, cause an offense. But, I mean, like we see this conservative movement and the, the power in it and um, the power in patriotism and, and the power and the fundamental of, of what makes our country great um, and the way that a lot of us are going in our country just goes against everything we're built on, yeah. everything you fought for. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating that it's come to the point where supporting our flag and freedom is like a some brands would deem like oh we don't want to go there like mm -hmm. it's like what or school systems yeah, that kick yeah. kids out for wearing a flag yeah, on their it's, it's right? it, it is so nuts but so i i think we're seeing a correction i think people are realizing you know the the insanity has it's it's, it's definitely peaked i hope for, yeah. you know for at least so you know that's one thing for us is like we're, we're never going to apologize for who we are yeah. and i think you have to have good product to be successful, but also I think the brand side is also really yeah. important, right? Well, and you guys are also open to like, hey, we ran this, it could be better. So yeah. we're gonna do it better next yep. time. Um, you know, I've talked to you guys a little bit on your outdoor stuff. You know, I, I started with uh, running uh, your lady's trail pant. Yeah. And I mean, I picked up a lot of burrs on it or whatever. And then I came back and I and I was talking to Kurt about it. He's like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing that same pattern or that same uh, design on the pant, but we're going to bring in a slightly different fabric and exactly. we're going to make it better because we realize we can make it better and having that humble approach 
um, companies that come out there and say, well, what I'm doing is the best period, and they're not open or receptive to commentary or feedback, that is their demise. Because there's always a better way to do stuff, and that's the evolution of, of manufacturing. And you guys are, you know, that's what I like about your product is, number one, it fits me because um, I'm pretty small so a lot of the you know manufacturers their smallest sizes might be a 30 inch waist well that's not gonna work for me you, know, you guys are making stuff to fit people like me but also your sizing on guys you know we I listened to a podcast where you guys were talking about thigh and calf size on yeah. dudes yeah. you know some guys are running these giant quads and in, in thighs and then these giant calves and some have little calves and you know trying to find you know robust gear that's going to you know handle the elements on the outdoor side but also fit your customers which which is, you know, being a woman and coming from a woman's frame, it's, it, the, the sizing on any kind of product is probably the most challenging aspect of manufacturing. Totally. Yeah, especially, I mean, the ladies' side. And, you know, believe it or not, 70% of our customers are women. Like, we're, yeah. we're a very female-heavy. But yeah. now, obviously, with outdoor and tactical, it's a little more male-heavy. But the core of our brand, the fitness part, you know, that was born 10 years ago, like, you know, Mal has crushed that. We're, you know, leggings and sports bras is kind of our go-to, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so when it comes to... You know, when we do with the outdoor stuff, like the Women's Frontier Pan, and we got the Frontier 2.0 coming, uh, I think, in June, like, we have a huge advantage because yeah. I see a lot of our competitors here. They're, you know, monster brands, but they don't really understand the female consumer. Mm -hmm. And they definitely don't understand fit, right? Well, and a lot um, of them aren't. They, they dabbled in investing in yeah. the female customer, and then they realize how small the market is, yeah. on, especially on the outdoor side. And, and ladies, I want to give you a little smack upside the head. I hear this from manufacturers all the time. Boots, clothing. We complain so loud. Oh, well, nothing fits me. And I know that. And then I say, well, did you buy that pair of boots that's in a women's or did you buy a men's version that fits you? Did you buy that pair of pants in women's or did you buy a men's pair that worked for you? Like if you want manufacturers to make stuff for us as women, we have to actually step up at retail and buy it. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it was funny because I, I kind of when we came, when, you know, launched outdoor a year and a half ago, we started with the men's loadout first, mm -hmm. and we didn't do the women's frontier <laughs> pant. We were like, all right, let's nail the men's and then do the women's. And I mean, we've learned our lesson, but like the the ladies were loud of being like, where's ours? You yeah. know what I mean? Especially for our brand, we have such a big female yeah. base. Um, and we quickly realized, like, all right, never do that again. If we're launching a men's product, we gotta launch a ladies version. Yeah. And even with our our tactical stuff, like our op camis, like our, our our assault pant, we're making a women's assault pant. And I don't, I don't even, I mean, I think there's a couple out there, but that doesn't exist because that market is so small. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like small. how many women need like a tactical pant, right? Um, well, but we were like, all right. Yeah. The two-way community for women's actually, <clears throat> I think much bigger than the hunting side. Yeah. You know, for sure, because there's so many competitive shooters and women in law enforcement and military. And, you know, the, that's a, that's a, I think that'll be a pretty good market for you guys. But there's so many brands that have fallen off on the manufacturing side on that, that you have an instant customer you can pick up and, and run with, you know, that, that, that feels disenfranchised. I mean, I'm I'm one of those c consumers on the outdoor apparel side that I feel like a little slighted when I have a company that at one point makes stuff for women and then they look at you and they say, well, you know, you should wear a men's jacket, but you know, I know you have hips, so take it to a tailor and yeah. have them cut the seam for you so it'll fit around your hips or, and I'm like, okay, you want me to buy a $250 jacket from you and then go have it tailored. Yeah, like, it doesn't I'm work not, like that. I'm not selling that to anybody and that doesn't work and, and women don't want to be sold that either. But what I like about what you guys are doing on your women's side you're launching the same stuff that you're doing for men with women, and I hate the huntress word, right? You don't call a doctor a doctoress, right? Women are hunters, just like guys, and the shrink it and pink it thing that a lot of manufacturers do within this industry, in this space, it doesn't, it's a it's a failure, like instant failure, and you guys aren't doing that. You're making the same legit gear for the women, you're just making it work for our different size, which is a super applaudable. Yeah, and I think, honestly, we have a massive advantage, I think, of some of these bigger brands that have been here a while because like when we look for example like when the new frontier 2.0 came to the office just in the office alone there's like 30 women right there that'll mm -hmm. like they'll they'll literally do a try on they kick all the guys yeah. out and they go in the comms room and they, they do try ons and like yeah. and they all critique it mm -hmm. and then we make the next one and these are you know a lot of them athletic built yeah. you know they're you know they're they're you know they're into fitness and stuff so um, by the time we get that final sample, like it's been vetted so hard by like mm -hmm. a bunch of people. Um, that, so I think that gives us a massive advantage. Yeah. It seems like an implied test. Like, well, of course you would do that. But from what I'm seeing, like, I'm like, are they not doing that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> based on the feedback on fit I see, I'm like, so that's an advantage we have. Um, and then, you know, everything we do, like, you know, with the men's stuff, like 
Aaron, T and E's everything, yeah. right? Even like the you know the Frontier panel where Aaron designed all the pocket configurations and stress mm -hmm. tested. We got stretchy rain gear coming out in August. I'm so um, stoked for that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing. It's like the rain gear. You got to be able to move in your, yeah. your shell. And you know, when I was in the military, the shell we were getting was this big bulky shell. And we if we were you know rucking for three days, um, you know through the mountains or whatever in like a wet environment and you have to wear your shell the whole time and you're, you can't move because you're you know what i mean so Stiff. um aaron you know stress test that and you know it, it, it the, the product has to be good because you might only get one chance at a consumer mm -hmm. right that that might be their first ever exposure oh what's this newborn primitive thing they get one product and if, it, if it's not good you're never getting them back they're going to move on and yeah. when it, when it's so competitive you can't afford for that to happen yeah, well, you have a good team that's helping you put all of this together. And that's one thing, you know, for you guys listening, it's not just Aaron testing the outdoor line. You guys have a lot of guys in the military that's testing yes. it out in the field that, that is out there, like, end use. The days and the hours that they're putting in this stuff is, is incredible. And it's beyond what most of us would ever do anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems, again, an implied task, but I, I'm seeing that a lot of brands. And then I, the same thing in the tactical space. It's like some of these tactical pants that they're selling to men, it's like, who designed this? Yeah, did, did they terrible. ask any guy, any guy like me or you know, that was in mm -hmm. that community any questions? And, mm -hmm. hey, do you like how the pockets are? Can you actually climb a ladder in this or run or jump? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's an active job. It mm -hmm. needs to be, you know, be able to move with you. So That's uh, one thing, like yeah. with me wearing men's pants that's so frustrating is my torso is so short. And I put on a pair of men's pants and the crotch goes down halfway to my knees and I'm trying to jump over a log and yeah. I got weight on yeah. it. I'm like, uh, Gotta like uh, hike your pants yeah, up. And yeah, and like yeah. pull them up. But yeah. then my pants, my backpack's pushing my pants off. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then people are like, well, put on a belt. And it's like, well, have you carried a 80 pound uh, pack uh, with uh -huh. a belt on and yep. you had a belt dig into your spinal mm -hmm. cord and your hip bones and your, like then you get hot spots and blisters. And like, it's really not, like if you're really using the product, the, all of these things that people think are simple solutions solutions that aren't actually out there using it they don't even get exactly right yep. and that's where what you guys are doing is great what led you so just to summarize high level for everybody listening watching you guys have your full like um, athletic line so CrossFit gym I wear it everywhere I don't my gym clothes are my clothes like last night I wore my black leggings with the fancy shirt okay so and did you wear the green flannel yesterday I to, wore the green flannel okay, yesterday I'm glad because I almost wore it so we would have been matched yeah I saw I it I was like, <laughs> I was like so, glad I, yeah, yeah. We, we deconflicted yeah. that yeah so I wear this stuff like I just I don't put on jeans I don't put on pants I wear I dress up my my gym clothes and I pretty much live in gym clothes anyway it's fine but you guys also have a campfire line so it's more like Henley shirts and like hoodies and Jeans, jean jackets, and flannels, and, and denim jackets. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So there's that whole component to what you're doing. But then also now, what led you? Obviously, we're talking about outdoor. I hunted yep. from October through um, January 15th in your outdoor line. So I, I don't have a ton of time in it. Yeah. Um, but it had all the rifle season in in your ladies' outdoor line. had had a great fall. Um, what made you guys like what made you decide like hey i'm not a hunter but i want to take and i want to step into this outdoor space so when i was in the military we we get some cold weather and like you know maritime kind of survival type training uh, we do it up in, in alaska so we get exposed to like the layering system and how to wear yeah. probably wear the layers and if you get wet how to let the system work so you can rewarm and, and all that stuff so that's where i got the exposure to the kind of the concept of like extended field stay, like what mm -hmm. you need to have and your, you know, how to pack your ruck and all like basic stuff. Right. But we were getting a brand that I, I don't really even really want to name, but the politics of the brand definitely didn't like guys like Navy SEALs and Green Berets, but they we're still, they still sold to the government because yeah. they wanted to make hundreds of millions of dollars off of us. So to me, there was like an ethical component to this. Yeah. It's like we, we are basically free advertising for this company. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars from our community yet they won't even sell it. They have to sell it through an intermediary because they want to have an arm distance length to say, oh, we don't sell, we don't support like these war fighters. You know what I mean? That drove me crazy. Yeah. But also the gear wasn't great either. And I was like, eventually I'm going to do this because I know I can do it better. Mm -hmm. um, but being active duty and like having our fitness line, it was like there were so many irons in the fire. I just, you know what I mean? I needed a, I didn't have the time and the bandwidth to do yeah. it. So when I got out, you know, I got paired up with Aaron. Um, you know, I knew enough to be dangerous. You know, I, I think I got it to the 80% mark. And then, you know, Aaron spending, you know, two, 200 plus days in the field mm -hmm. every year. Who's better than to validate the concept and refine it than a guy like him? Because as you know, like, if you screw up a piece of gear and you're, you know, three days into something in the field, like, that can be 
hopefully not a fatal mistake, mm -hmm. but it could be at, at the very least a major inconvenience and yeah. something that makes you very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's something you don't want to ever make that mistake ever again. And if you do, then you're like, okay, now I know and you'll never do it again. So we wanted to stress test it for, for that reason. Um, and, and Aaron helped us with all of that. Obviously he's got a lot of credibility in the space. And, uh, and that to me, that was critical because I had yeah. to acknowledge, hey, I didn't grow up hunting. I'm not a hunter. I'm getting into it. So this year, the goal is, you know, because well, I. Well, you're a hunter. You just haven't hunted big game animals. <laughs> Let's just preface that to everybody listening. Like, don't sell yourself short because there's skills that you have outweigh any skill that I would have in my 40 years of hunting, right? Like, I, so it all translates, right? You know what you're doing. You just haven't been out there and, and done it yet. Yeah, and I would say, like, I'm kind of a cousin, not a sibling, right? Like, I, I, can, I can obviously go in the woods. I know how to pack a rock. I know how to layer up. Like, I'm, you I'm know how to shoot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just I haven't put it all together yeah. for, to hunt an animal. Yeah. But, uh, but it was, to me, it was important. I had to be humble enough to know, okay, I don't, while I, I know enough to be dangerous, I don't know this space. Yeah. So Aaron had to put the finishing touches on everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, you know, I think that was a good, a good plan. And, um, you know, that's worked well for us. Every piece of gear we do, it goes, he's the last mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and he gets final say in you know, all the features, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of what motivated me. One was like a chip on my shoulder because I was like, these brands – don't actually support the warfighter mm -hmm. and also i didn't think it was good enough gear um and you know even with the fit some of the stuff we were getting like the, we i remember this grid fleece we were issued it was like a belly shirt oh it was like an which XL. i love a belly shirt yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah for, for fashion but not yeah, yeah, I'm yeah yeah I don't want um, a belly and shirt. i'm like <laughs> how does a company that's worth billions like get this so wrong um and then same thing with tactical um a lot of the stuff we were getting issued same idea um actually the same entity um it hated us but they were they were trying to sell you know these op camis to us and that's what we're in with our body armor and, and you couldn't move in it it was mm -hmm. this heavy nylon cotton blend you know for us we would get wet a lot so like it's like it and would it never dry. dry yeah and you know if you try to climb a ladder there's there was no mobility it's mm -hmm. like there's a there's an athletic component to what we do you know you wouldn't have like a NFL football player wear a pair of nylon cotton pants. He's wearing stretchy pants because yeah. he's got to run. He's got to move. You know what I mean? It's like, why are they not applying that same principle to us, our job? Because it is. It's exactly what we're doing. Well, and you guys are still, and I, I'm a podcast listener, so I've listened to some of their, like, behind-the-scenes podcasts with Aaron's and yours, and there's still, like, this internal fight between Kurt and Aaron. It's actually hilarious <laughs> to me on – wool versus synthetic yeah and kurt is like diehard wool like his dream set is wool wool wool. and i get it doesn't smell yeah. it's warm when it's wet like all these great wool is a great great fabric yes but then i also resonate so well with aaron because i'm packing this stuff and lightweight and you know all of these things and so like there's this dichotomy <laughs> when it comes to apparel when you are going to do limited skews yeah. and in a limited assortment where do you invest in that you know do you invest in some of those natural fabrics or do you do blends or you know how to do that so it is an evolving process for you guys um and the only reason i bring this stuff up is because you've been public about it and yeah i've heard these stories yeah. and and it is it is a thing you know and this is what a lot of manufacturers go through of you know what is the consumer demand who is our target audience where are we wanting to get our products who's really going to be the end user are they going to be somebody that's climbing up a tree stand whitetail hunting which i would love to have wool for right because it's quiet yeah. Um, it doesn't matter if it's heavy. The farthest I'm walking is, you know, 500 yards from my truck to my deer stand. Or am I going backcountry on a sheep hunt for 15 days? Um, I might not bring the same thing. I might not bring that heavy gear when, when ounces count, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, that, you know, we found, I think the answer is in the middle. Uh, yeah. So our, our base layers, it's a merino mm -hmm. wool polyester blend. Yeah. I kind of side with Aaron on this because if it's, from what we've seen, if it's if it's like 100% merino, the first time you put it on, it feels great. It's mm -hmm. like it fits good, um, but it can get scratchy, Itchy. right? And then it loses its shape. Yeah. Like it, you end up having this big boxy in it, or like you know on the it on, on, out on as your you long wash johns, it. like it's all saggy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see, so we were like with with enough polyester, it still has all the good qualities of merino. You know, the antimicrobial. If it gets wet, it's still you still have some insulation value yeah. to it. Um, but there's enough polyester that it's soft and it retains its shape. So yeah. it's it's an iterative process, it right? Is. Um, it's not and, the easiest uh, thing. Yeah. And whether you're Western big game hunting during rifle season or archery season or if you're in a stand hunting, I mean, 
like the the use or the applications for your apparel will vary so much you know what I wear pretty much stays the same I'm glad you guys have a solid assortment for women um, I and like you guys when you watch my series this next year you look at my photos from this last fall I was wearing it everywhere I went and a lot of people are like oh you bow hunted in solids it's like well yeah I did I have some gorgeous photos where this like coyote brown color and I had golden leaves in the in the white tail stand and like the pictures were beautiful like I don't I don't care what anybody says I didn't need camo up there it was gorgeous you know it looked good the deer the deer were moving and, and I didn't have any issues with solids versus camo and I think you guys are are good with making this stuff because you can buy a pair of pants or a shirt in, or a jacket and you can wear it hunting but then also I can just go wear it I'm not limited to like oh I just spent all this money on these pants that I can't wear to dinner because we all know I'm wearing the same clothes to the gym I'm still also wearing it to dinner and I'm probably wearing the same pants that I hunt in also to dinner um, and you can use it across multiple disciplines as well, shooting sports or, you know, whatever you guys are doing. Yeah, and that was a lot of the, re the reasoning behind it. And again, since I didn't know the outdoor space, you know, I went to Aaron and Aaron was like, hey, we don't need camo. No. He'll stalk up to something six yards away and shoot it with a bow. Like, yeah. if, 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 bow. if anyone can prove that you don't need it, it's him. It's so I deferred to him and he's like, no, yeah. let's start solids. And yeah. that was, to give him credit, that was a big reason was like, hey, you know, a lot of these people might be shopping on a budget. So if they're, if they're going to spend a couple hundred bucks on a puff jacket or this and that, like they also need to be able to wear it to dinner or the store yeah. or whatever. And it, it needs it can become an everyday part of their, you know, what I mean, not to say you can't wear a camo jacket to the store. But I think, you Most know, people do. some of us might be like, all right, like <laughs> maybe that's a little bit dorky. But, you know, if you Fashion do that, camo. yeah, if it's all good, like I'm not judging, but uh, it's a little bit, you know, a black or, or coyote brown puff jacket is a little bit more discreet than like your, you know, camo. Puff well, jacket and my, yeah. I mean, my puff jackets, I just, I wear them everywhere. Like, no, you're right. it's nice that I don't have to be like, oh, I need to go grab a different jacket now to go to dinner when I have this one on my coat rack. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's just nice the multifunction. You're going to spend the money. You can use it more often. It's not like your pants are hanging in your closet just for hunting season. Yeah. Like, you can wear them every day. And you can dress them up. Like, a lot of these pants, you know, you, you put a nice shirt with those pants, and you're going to look nice. I do it with leggings all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the time. So it's fun. Um, so your tactical line, I'm super stoked about that. Um, I know you have some things coming down the pipes. I don't want to get ahead of myself on introing anything. So what do you have coming for tactical this year? Um, so for tactical, we're going to keep rolling out. So we're going to be launching our multi-cam op camis um, or assault camis, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we got some tiger stripe patterns coming okay. just come more for fun. Yeah. Um, but I think for tactical, we want to keep it really simple. Yep. Uh, we got wi uh, women's range leggings coming. That's where I was, uh, I was yep, going, yeah. but I didn't, then, wanna, like, um, I didn't want to throw it out we're there. We're making what we call yep. like low-vis gear. Yep. So like uh, we, they're going to be called the recon jeans. They have kind of mag pouches. They're very discreet. Yep. Um, but, you know, for tactical, like we want to keep it pretty simple, like yep. make some really good op camis and then a few accessories. Like I think the range leggings are going to kill. Yeah. Once again, we looked at the space. Like, all right, there are some competitors in this space that make range leggings, but they're not true like women's apparel companies, right? Mm -hmm. They're taking a swing at it, yeah. um, and it's like leggings is our that's our go-to. Like yeah. if anyone can do a legging, it's us. It's you guys. So having kind of you know the the in-house knowledge, but then being able to validate it like mm -hmm. we always do with with these women that are credible in the space that need you know what I mean. Yeah. And we're, so can I, you elaborate on the range legging? I mean, is this going to be a concealed carry type legging, or or is it going to have belt loops to where I can yes. I can run like my holsters yes. and you know carry it'll, outside the waistband exactly. on them it, it's okay. meant to hold a shooting belt and then okay. it'll have like mag pouches along okay. the side and okay. i think we're so on it's like not a concealed carry legging necessarily. no yeah, okay. yeah i don't i wouldn't consider it that okay. um but you know I, I suppose it could be but i think that we are we're designing it more like you know you're at the range you yeah, got your shooting yeah, belt training, you know, that, whole, whatever, that whole yeah. thing so um but we, you know we have people validating and testing where i think we're on like the fourth or fifth version i'll be riding horses yeah. in them okay there you <laughs> go yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'll be horseback um, riding in the range leggings because that's all i'll want to carry yeah and then you know on on the outdoor side i think the biggest innovation will be we're going to upgrade the frontier pant um in june it'll be the 2.0 and then we'll launch the ladies frontier light um for the first time yeah, yeah i think you probably had the trail pant I that was the, the one yeah mm -hmm. and that you know that's a great example because that was in direct response to feedback from people yeah. like you and other it was like, hey, great pant, but it, you know, shit get, kind of gets snagged on it. So we're like, hey, let's go back to the drawing board, find a different yeah. fabric that's you know similar. Yeah. Um, and we're like, hey, let's just make the frontier light, just yeah. like we have the men's. Yeah. Um, and then and then our, our stretchy rain shell, yeah. um, which is like we actually have it over there, but it's you know for the first time 
I've ever had one. It's a shell that that you can move, you can in, move in, and it's it's nuts. It's Super very expensive. Super lightweight or how yeah. heavy? What are we talking? I would say thickness. it's 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 middle of the road. Okay. Um, you know, we didn't want to go crazy light. Well, no, because um, then you snag it on everything. Exactly. And destroy it um, but we also didn't need it crazy heavy. So we we had sent Aaron a couple different thicknesses, yeah. and he wore the the samples, mm-hmm. and I think he was wore it like up north somewhere, and it rained a ton, and he came back and was like, "Hey, this thing's good to go." Mm-hmm. Um, so we're really stoked on that, and. Um, you know, I think in the near term, that's that's kind of the, the you know. Oh, and then last, we're we're launching. I'm actually wearing the prototypes. Uh, our assault boot. It'll be okay. called the Patriot One. Okay. Um, so mainly for military guys, but it's honestly like you could wear it. Just I'm wearing it. Yeah, just normal. They're, they're you know cool what I mean? But finishes. it's got like little fast road stri- strip on the inside and a bunch of stuff for guys like us that we would need on the job. So um, those are kind of the, the most you know the upcoming stuff we got coming. Yeah, it's yeah. exciting. You guys, if you're like me, you are totally dependent on OnX Hunt for nearly everything from hunting, navigating backcountry roads, even real estate. But being an elite member with OnX has so many benefits that you guys are going to want to take advantage of if you're not already doing so. For example, you're going to have access to all 50 states plus Canada with tons of valuable resource, landowner information, and you're also going to get added benefits like draw odds with top rut that will help you with all of your application seasons and benefits through hunting Fool magazine and to boot you guys they've got tons of great specials through partners like silencer central where if you're an on x elite member you really benefit from those partnerships so if you guys aren't a member i encourage you go online to the on x hunt website use code wild 20 at checkout and you're going to save 20 percent you're going to love being an Onyx Hunt Elite member. So on colorways, you guys have, um, now last year, I don't recall seeing this like olivey green that you have. I remember the gray, the coyote browns, the blacks. Is this new, this color that you guys launched? Which one? The, the one that's behind us, kind of the green color. Yeah, the, the, the green, we've revised it just a smidge. Okay. And, and honestly, like it's a great outdoor color, but yeah. it also aligns with the tactical colorways okay, we're going to cool. need. Because a lot of this stuff, we're going st- to be selling to military units, right? Yeah because we need military units need extended field stay stuff too. Okay. Um, so that was part of it was like, okay. let's, let, you know, let's move it one shade over. So it like aligns with the, you know, the op candy. So is the ways. brown kind of going away and fading into this more olive color? Or uh, are you no, the, both? The, the brown will still be here. The brown will yeah. Still yeah. Be. So, we'll, so will you yeah. have those? Cause last year in the ladies jackets, you guys had black and you didn't have the coyote or the olive. Are you going to maybe offer one of the two? I think so. Okay. I, that'd be cool. I can't. All right. I, I, well, I don't we don't know. know. Yeah, All right. Yeah. We're going to move on. TBD. To be determined. Things are changing. I should know that. It's all good. So you, um, um, you guys as a company, you know, you're you're new in this space, but you're already like super philanthropic. Um, now on the athletic side, you guys, like during Labor Day, you guys did a huge giveaway where people went online and they bought and you gave what percentage to, to it Veterans Day? Uh, it was Veterans Day weekend. Veterans Day so, weekend. So the last three years, and we'll do it every year, um, Veterans Day weekend, we'll donate 100% of our profits um, up to 100K um, yeah. in, you know, to veteran charities. So it's a cool, obviously, you know, it's close to our heart being yeah. a veteran owned company. Um, and yeah, so we were able to donate a hundred thousand dollars the last two years. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on the 10 year mark. Obviously we bootstrapped this whole thing. We've never raised any money, raised any capital. Um, but we're proud to say, you know, we're coming up to, you know, close to $2 million donated to date as a company, um, to a lot of veteran charities, first responder charities, um, some cancer research and prevention. And, um, now that we're in this space, you know, we want to, we want to be contributing to wildlife conservation too. So, well, last night or no, not Friday night, you guys did a huge donation, which included, well, I'll let you explain the donation, (laughs) but it made $85,000. Well, actually 170. One's okay. So they sold it twice. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so I went to the, the auction last year, you know, it was my first time being here and I'm, I'm kind of learning the scene and learning mm-hmm. the game, you know what I mean? And, um, I saw all these tags going for, you know, Huge six money. figures. Um, and I thought, man, this is cool, but what if we could put our little, our little spin on it, make it a little bit more exciting. So the idea of a skydive elk hunt concept was born, mm-hmm. um, and, and I'm sitting at the table, probably drinking a few beers and, uh, you know, we thought it was a, a, a great, great way to, you know, raise money for charity. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, we've had the last year to plan this, but we locked in the aircraft, we got helicopters, we got the, you know, the guys that will jump the donors out of the plane, you know, we're going to tandem jump and we're going to kind of make it like a uh, kind of a mission vibe, mm-hmm. like a military vibe to kind of mm-hmm. show them a little bit of our world, of what that's like. Um, so yeah, uh, Friday night was the big auction. I had no idea how it was going to go. John got me up on stage oh, yeah. 
I watched you live. Well, he so John told me before, you know, because I was a little bit nervous, and he's like, "Oh, you'll, you're not going to need to talk. Like, we're just going to bring you." And up. then he put the fire and, on you. And Aaron was supposed to come up with me, Aaron, no. Aaron Snyder, and then Donnie coming. Edwards from the Best Events Foundation. But now I'm looking at back at their table, and like they're gone. Yeah. And like our we're, our auction items coming up, and I'm like, "What am I going to do? Yeah. No, one, like, no one knows who the hell I am. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm just some, you know, a- average Joe." And then our video is playing, and John, it's like 30 seconds left of the video, hands you the mic, and he's like, hey, just when this ends, just say something. I was like, what do you, like, John, what do you yeah. want? He shotgun me. So the video ends, and I have the microphone. I'm looking out over 2,000 people, and I'm like, all right, here we go. Yeah. But it was really cool. You know, we'll, it, we, it went for 170000 um, and we'll you know, be able to make a huge check to yeah. um, SFW. We'll get part of it, and yeah. then a bunch of veteran charities will get, uh, uh, you know, the other chunk of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really awesome. Last night I met one of the ladies that bought the opportunity, <laughs> and she oh, was she's smoking pumped. on she is Fire. She is like freaking out. Yeah. She, which is super awesome because one guy bought one opportunity and a lady bought the other opportunity, yeah. which goes to show you how important it is for you guys to be in both both spaces on your outdoor side. Um, but she was on fire over it. She is so excited. Yeah. The, and the goal, hopefully, this will be something we can do every year. Yeah. And just it's kind of known as the Born Primitive Outdoor, like, you know, Scott yeah. Elkhorn. And, yeah. you know, we can leverage it to raise a ton of money for mm-hmm. charity. I think it can go for more in the future when more people have yeah. heard about it. Yeah. Um, but still awesome. 170 grand that we could yeah. do. I mean, that'll, that's really cool. But you could pair it with any hunt. You could be like, hey, we're going to do a sheep combo or what, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you could, could make it into whatever you want and, and grow. And, and it's a great way for you to contribute back to conservation. I think if you're going to take from this space and, you know, we also have to give back. And that's the great thing about being a hunter is, you know, our license and tag sales are funding 75% of state conservation budgets. You know, our Pittman Roberts dollars, when we buy firearms, when we buy ammunition, we're funding national conservation. But hunters really do triple down and people like you are really tripling down with that by going and saying, I'm going to give my time and my treasure and and help share something to make a, a, a massive impact. I mean, the ripple effect from over $170,000 is tremendous for conservation and for veterans. So I applaud you guys, you know, second year in this space of coming in so heavy and, and stepping up really and, and contributing so much, especially when you've never taken, right? Like personally, you haven't taken. You're like, hey, I'm here, I'm new, I'm gonna give first. That speaks so much to what the foundation of this company is built on is, is giving first, like you have given to your country and you've given so much before you ever asked anybody for anything. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I think one thing I've learned from kind of entering this space that I think I kind of I, I kind of knew, but now I really know is I think there's like almost this stereotype that like hunters and like people that are more conservative are less concerned with like, cons- you know what I mean? Conservation. Yeah. It's kind of like this hippie fringe thing. They wish it was it, their thing. And, it's our it, thing. Well, that, that, no, that's the thing. <laughs> that's for sure. And, and yeah. I, I now know it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of flipped, right? Yeah. And, and, and people in the hunting space that, you know, tend to lean a little bit more conservative are, 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 are so about taking care of. Um, you know, the wildlife, you know, because it, yeah. of course, preserves our ability to hunt and, you know, yeah. continues it for the next generation. Yeah. So that's the coolest thing that I've learned from all this is like, man, they, they actually have it all wrong. So for us to be able to play a very small part in contributing to that yeah. um, and uh, and obviously, you know, what we see at the auctions, wild, you know, that raise, so wild. it's so cool yeah. to see how much money they raise. And, you know, we'll continue to try to leverage our platform and, um, you know, play, you know, be a small cog in that wheel for, for hopefully many years. So where are you planning on hunting this year? What are your hopes and dreams, if you will? I got to get with Aaron. We were supposed to do the BC one yeah. last year in August. Um, and, you know, I was going through some some family stuff, so yeah. I, I had to cancel. Um, but, yeah, it was, like, going to be, like, an 11-day BC hunt. And, yeah. Um, Viking Armament made us uh, made me a rifle. And Night Force, th- you, know, you know, sent me the optics, and we we got it doped in and everything. Yep. And it was like we, we were all excited, and it, like we got into like late June, and yep. Aaron was like, "Hey, man, if you got this crazy family stuff going on, like you it's might okay. you might not want to be off the grid for like 11 days with no phone." You know what I mean? And I was like, "All right, that's fair." So he he swapped me out for somebody else. So that's we still got to figure it out. Um, but, but you're gonna be doing it this year. I need to get out there because one. Literally 100% of the people that I know that do this, that, you know, we're all pretty wired the same. It's like you get hooked. And so I know there's magic to it that I haven't experienced. It's changing. It is. And, yeah. and I've heard that. And so I'm like, I have to do this yeah. one because, you know, per, on a personal level, I want to. But from a business standpoint, I also need to understand the consumer better. Mm-hmm. Right. Because mm-hmm. like the early days of CrossFit, I, it was so easy for me to market to them because I was one of them. Yeah. And while like we talked about, I think I'm, I'm a cousin. I'm like that maybe that first cousin. Yeah. 
I'm not I'm not a sibling, right? Yeah. Like, I, and, and I need to become one. Yeah. And so I, oh, now I fully understand and, yeah. and I know the magic, yeah. right? And I know the mentality. So I think it, you know, there's kind of a, you know, two re, two big reasons I need to get into it. Um, and obviously, you know, I have an advantage with kind of having the connections with yeah. the errands of the world, you know what I mean? And obviously all the great people here that, mm-hmm. hey, yeah, come on, come join us on this one. And mm-hmm. people are sending us guns and, you know, like yeah. it's, 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 I have a little bit of an advantage, probably a big advantage to come in, in in a way that would be really exciting and, and I have the right people showing me how it's done. Are you going to yeah. pick up bow hunting or are you going to stick with rifle I think hunting? rifle first, yeah, but smart. then it sounds like like it bows the move. You know what I mean? Like it's a, you know, like, I mean, shit, if Aaron gets me 300 yards from from a bull and it's like I'm shooting in the, I mean, it's like that's, I hear you. you can't miss. Yeah. You know what I mean? I hope not. Yeah. If, if, you, if you do, it's okay. Yeah. But like, Roger you know what I mean? Like that seems a little, yeah. I don't want to say easy, yeah. but with, you know, a guy with like a him. Bow, but yeah, it's, now, oh, now yeah. it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. So to me, I think the crawl, walk, run, like let's mm-hmm. do, let's get rifle down. Yeah. Let's work our field craft a little bit and kind of get, you know, get the right gear that I think I need and get comfortable you know, with all that mm-hmm. stuff, and then all right, let's do, let's yeah. let's transition. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great idea, and I love both. I mean, there's nothing that I love more than archery elk hunting. Like, there, if I had to pick one animal for the rest of my life to hunt, it would be archery elk with a bow, just because you can talk to them. Yeah. And and I love calling elk. So. Yeah, as you can hear in the the convention yeah. here. And <laughs> I really hope yeah. you get to experience that, you know, sooner rather than later as well. But I think that's awesome. Um, Night Force is a great partner of mine. Oh, and, nice. Um, so uh, actually. We, you guys have a 16-foot uh, banner at Iwa right now with me head to toe and oh, MVP. Oh, nice! It's heck yeah, badass. You'll have to and send me the picture. I have yeah. the. I, I Kurt has it. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's got it. Nice. But, um, I'm waiting for them to send me a picture of the booth because Iwa was going on what last week? When was Iwa? Something like that. Um, so they're they're a good partner. Is it in March? Iwa in March? Okay, so when it goes on in March, I'll make sure we get a booth photo to you nice, guys. Nice, nice. Um, but they're a good partner and and. Precision optics, you know, as you know, when you're trained and you have good gear, when you have that shot, the rest is just you making it happen. Is this the right animal? And so I, I think, you know, for you to graduate and be like, hey, I did that, but now, you know, I'm also ready to do these other things. You're going to have, once you tick one off the list, you're going to, it's going to be a wild fair. They're just, <laughs> you're going to want to do it all. And nobody's going to see you in the office ever again. No, I know. You're going to be out with Aaron. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> it's like, you know, these, these guys that literally like, all of September, they're just gone. <laughs> like it's that's like that's literally life. Yes. Yes. Yep. yes. So I'm learning. I'm learning that. All October, it's like yep. September, October, November. You want me to do what? Uh, uh-uh, uh. I'm not doing anything. No, you're out in the bush for 90 days I and you don't it. leave it. I and love and it. actually, it starts in August with mountain hunting. Yeah. And as early as July uh, for sheep in some in some places. So it is. It is really a. It's a light. Well, it's a year round. I mean, for me, it's year round. I don't stop. You know, I go from one to the next, right? So I'll start. I'll go home hunt coyotes, and then I'll hunt uh, turkeys, and then I roll into spring bear, and then you know we'll kind of take a pause over the summer, and then hunt roe deer, antelope, and then you you know it just goes, it just doesn't stop, and and you'll get there too where you're where you're on fire for it. And um, any anything else you want to kind of connect with the viewers or listeners? Ah, uh, no, I think you know closing kind of thoughts for me it's like you know we're, we're we're new to the space but i think the the foundation of our brand you know we love our country we love everyone that's served and mm-hmm. while I, I don't think that needs to be the determining factor in in supporting a brand like yeah. if, if that's important to you just know like that's a it's that's a big that's a big part of who we are yeah um there's a lot of really good brands uh, yeah, especially on this floor that that we compete with that make great product and, yeah. and i you know commend them for that but i think what makes us a little bit different is the values of our company you know we're, we're not afraid to kind of wear them on our sleeve and, and really just be unapologetic in that not in a you know in an intimidating or abrasive way but hey this is you know i think we live in the greatest country in the world and mm-hmm. a lot of people have died defending it um mm-hmm. so let's not be shy about being proud of that yeah um so uh, and you know, you're yeah. here live literally living the american dream i mean you're and you're on the floor you're working your booth you're you're connecting with your customer you're hearing what people are saying you're listening to the feedback and then you're going back to the drawing board and you're literally going to bed with this on your shoulders at night and going back to the office on monday and back to the drawing board all over again based off of everything you hear here so you know i want to encourage all of you guys when you are at these shows come in meet the team talk to them learn about the products, find out more information, go online, email me, email or DM Aaron, although getting hold of Aaron is like impossible, <laughs> so don't do that yeah. actually. Uh, but DM me if you have questions or DM, I don't know who else you guys have like on your on your team on the outdoor space, but um, anybody at Kafaro, you know, Kafaro's retailing for you guys too, so yeah. if you go on their, their website, um, 
or email their customer service team that they're going to be able to answer questions for you as well. Yeah, and you can DM our, so we got our regular Instagram, it's just at Born Primitive and then Born Primitive Outdoor and Born Primitive Tactical. You can DM us. Yeah. We're really good about so responding. So all three handles on Instagram and then also across the board on Facebook? Yeah, well, yeah, Facebook and then the website's the same way. If you yeah. go to our main website, bornprimitive.com, you can find everything. So you can mm -hmm. find the outdoor collection. Yep. But if you want more of an outdoor experience, go to bornprimitiveoutdoor.com. Yeah. And that, you know, that you'll see, you know, people drawing bows and that whole thing since, yeah. you know, we have multiple facets of our brand. If you go to the main page, you might not, it might not feel like an outdoor brand. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to sell sports bras to girls still. So it's a, it's a balance. It's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, their target market. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then bornprivetactical.com yeah. is another one that has all of our tactical stuff we talked yeah. about too. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the ladies will be coming out soon. And you guys kind of keep watching my social media too because I'll be announcing new products. I'm trying to wear new products all the time. You guys were so generous. You sent me a ton of gear. And you guys are watching my threads and my feeds and I'm kind of showing off a lot of the stuff that they have. They have so much fun stuff to wear that's comfortable, functional, and same on the outdoor side. So when you guys are looking through my photos from this fall, just know that I'm wearing Born Primitive in them. And if you have questions, just ask. Um, and I appreciate your time again for being here. And I appreciate all of you for tuning into this episode. Um, thank our great partners. we got Ruger Marlin. We've got SCI on X, Wilderness Athlete, Kafaru, Born Primitive, all great partners of mine. If you guys like this podcast and you want to share it with someone, we encourage you like subscribe, share, go to my website, go to PursueTheWild.com. I've got a Born Primitive icon on the uh, homepage of my website. Click it, it'll take you right to their website. I also have a discount tab. So if you click that, I've got a discount code, KTITUS10, or no, Christy10. It'll save you 10% on an order. So um, we want to hook you up. So thank you for listening and uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. We're going to go talk it. to some people, hustle some clothes. All right, see you guys. <laughs> thank you. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet, and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments. Look no further than Hornady Outfitter Ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.